A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 16 and 22 through 26. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat this Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the householder, The teacher says, Where is my guest room where I am to eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. There prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. And as they were eating, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, my beloved friends, the most blessed solemnity of the most holy body and blood of Christ to each and every one of you. As you might have noticed over the last several Sundays, we have celebrated a number of Solemnities. Solemnities refer to the highest order of feast that are celebrated throughout the course of our liturgical year. You have memorials, you have feasts, and then you have solemnities. A few Sundays ago, we celebrated the great solemnity of Pentecost, which marked the conclusion of the Easter season. And so we find ourselves in ordinary time, but we inaugurate this period known as ordinary time, which strictly speaking is not a liturgical season per se, we mark the beginning of ordinary time with two consecutive solemnities. In our last episode, we reflected upon the readings for the solemnity of the Most Holy Trinity, which celebrates the great mystery, the greatest mystery of our faith, namely the mystery of God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, the triune God. And the following Sunday, the church celebrates another great solemnity, the solemnity of the most holy body and blood of Christ. Essentially, we are celebrating this great mystery of our faith that we refer to as the Holy Eucharist. And I'm anxious to dive into this rich collection of readings as the church beckons us to reflect upon and to ponder and to meditate upon this core mystery of our faith. And so we're going to begin with today's gospel which it's no surprise to us that we're finally returning to the gospel according to St. Mark, which is the gospel set apart for us to reflect upon over the course of year B of our three-year liturgical cycle. And so let's begin with verse 12. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover. Let's stop there. Mark clues us into the fact that it is the time of the Passover. And he uses two terms here. He first speaks of the first day of unleavened bread, which is in and of itself a feast, but a feast that coincides, that is intimately related to the Passover. Now, I know that most, if not all of you are familiar with the Passover. You can reference Exodus chapter 12, which describes the first Passover meal that God enjoined Moses and the Israelites to celebrate in anticipation of their flight from Egypt, in anticipation of their exodus. But here I want to point out to you that this feast of Passover in the tradition of the Jews also coincided with another feast known as unleavened bread, which was a seven-day feast. And by the time of the first century, by the time of Jesus, these two feasts were essentially considered one feast, an eight-day-long feast, which is precisely why we find this language here, going back to the text, and on the first day of unleavened bread. 
This feast lasted seven days. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb. So we see that the first day of what in the first century they refer to as unleavened bread was really the feast of Passover, which marked the beginning of what they also refer to as unleavened bread. These two terms were interchangeable. So they could call it Passover, which would include the seven days of unleavened bread, or they would call it unleavened bread, which would include on the very first day, Passover. I hope that makes sense. By the time of the first century, these two feasts had essentially fused together. And just to give you some background on this, if you turn with me to the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, verses 4 through 6, we read as follows, quote, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, in the evening is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month, which by the way is the very next day, is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Close quote. And so we see here in Leviticus 23, the intimate relationship between these two feasts. Passover, which then leads us to the feast of unleavened bread. Seven days during which they would feast on unleavened bread. By the time of the first century, these two feasts had, for all intents and purposes, fused together into one, which is why this feast was referred to interchangeably as Passover or Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, just to underscore the significance of the fact that Jesus institutes the Eucharist during the Passover, the Eucharist really is the fulfillment of, of the Passover. It is the New Testament or New Covenant Passover. The Catechism has a beautiful citation here in paragraph 1340 that I want to share with you, which underscores the intimate connection between the Passover of the Jews and the new Passover instituted by Jesus in the upper room at the Last Supper. 1340 reads as follows, quote, By celebrating the Last Supper with his apostles, in the course of the Passover meal, Jesus gave the Jewish Passover its definitive meaning. Jesus, passing over to his Father by his death and resurrection, the new Passover, is anticipated in the supper and celebrated in the Eucharist, which fulfills the Jewish Passover and anticipates the final Passover of the church in the glory of the kingdom. Close quote. That is so profound. The Catechism underscores the intimate connection between the Jewish Passover, which anticipates the Passover of the Lord, Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, who offers us his very body and blood for us to consume, as the Israelites did in the times of old. They consumed the flesh, and they applied the blood of the lamb to the doorpost and the lintel of their homes. Just reference Exodus chapter 12. All of this was a prefigurement, a foreshadowing of what Jesus would accomplish in the fullness of time when he would offer himself up as the lamb of God. He would be pierced for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. His blood would be shed for our salvation. His flesh would be offered to us as food, his blood as drink. There's so much that is taking place in this narrative of the Last Supper, and I don't want you to miss a bit of it. And so in sharing this citation, I want to underscore the fact that there is much that is taking place here. Jesus is not merely observing the Jewish law, the Mosaic command that they celebrate annually, this feast of Passover, and that they remember. No, Jesus is transcending. He is fulfilling the Passover. The Passover of the Jews anticipates the Passover of the Lord. Now, picking back up, our text in verse 13 reads, and he sent two of his disciples. Now, these two disciples are unnamed here, but if you were to go with me very quickly to Luke's account of the preparation for the Last Supper, in chapter 22 of Luke, Beginning in verse 7, we read as follows. 
Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Verse 8, So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. So these two disciples, these unnamed disciples in Mark's gospel, are identified in Luke's gospel as Peter and John. And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the householder, The teacher says, Where is my guest room, where I am to eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went into the city and found it as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. Let's stop there. It's very interesting here. Jesus, in response to their question, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He, I think, astonishes them. He sends Peter and John and gives them explicit instructions. Go into the city, that is, into Jerusalem, and the man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. So Jesus here, in a prophetic manner, is laying out for them exactly what is going to unfold. He sends them into the city. In the city, they're going to encounter a man carrying a jar of water. This man will meet them, and they are to follow him. So what's going on here? Well, they would have clearly recognized this man because according to Jewish tradition and and custom, it was not customary for men to carry water jars. That was the task relegated to women. It was a domestic chore for them to fetch the water from the well. And so to see a man carrying a water jar, that would have been striking. And so it would have been easy for them to recognize this man in the midst of the throng of pilgrims. You can imagine hundreds of thousands of pilgrims converged upon the city of Jerusalem in anticipation of this feast. And so it would have been difficult for them to identify anyone. Jesus gives them clear instructions. They are to see a man carrying a water jar. Now, there are some scholars that suggest that this man was more than likely a member of the Essene community, the Essene sect, which was, for all intents and purposes, we could liken it to a monastic community, a religious community of men. And this community, because it was a community comprised of men that did not admit women, the men would have been responsible for these kinds of domestic chores, that is, fetching the water. And since the upper room is believed to be located in the quarter of Jerusalem associated with the Essene community, it is believed by many scholars that this man identified here as a man carrying a water jar was more than likely a member of the Essene community. There are a number of scholars that believe that Jesus was associated in some way, shape, or form with this community, and that even John the Baptist was a member of the Essene community. But that's for another Bible study at another time. I find that a very, very fascinating and compelling argument. And so the disciples are instructed to follow this man. And verse 14, wherever he enters, say to the householder, the teacher says, the rabbi says, where is my guest room where I am to eat the Passover with my disciples? And so this strongly suggests that Jesus had already prearranged to celebrate the Passover with his disciples in this upper room, at this location. Which makes sense, given the fact that Jerusalem was absolutely jam-packed with pilgrims. It would have been absolutely impossible to find a place in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover unless it were pre-arranged. Verse 15, And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. There prepare for us. So Jesus in a very sovereign manner, (laughs) prophetically. He's indicating to his disciples that that everything has been prearranged. And what they are required to do, these disciples, they are required to make the final preparations for the Passover. For it states in verse 16, And the disciples set out and went into the city and found it as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. What does it mean they prepared the Passover? Passover. 
The room was furnished and ready. What did Peter and John have to do? Well, remember, the Passover was not merely a meal. It was also a sacrifice. So Jesus sends Peter and John to Jerusalem, to the temple, to procure and to sacrifice a lamb that would be consumed, that would be eaten at this Passover meal. And so Peter and John set out. They procure a lamb according to the prescriptions of the Mosaic law, a spotless lamb, a lamb without blemish, a male lamb, and a lamb with no broken bones. And upon procuring this lamb, they had to now bring it before the priest. And in presenting the lamb to the priest who was on the other side of a low wall, they had to extend the neck of the lamb over the wall and slit its throat. And the priest would catch the blood emanating from the lamb in this basin. And then the priest would take the basin filled with the blood of the lamb and they would pour it over the altar. This was part of the sacrifice, the ritual sacrifice of the Jews during the Passover. But then, and this is important to note, then the lay person, either Peter or John, would then have to take the lamb and they would have to prepare it for the Passover meal. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. Dr. Brant Petrie, who's one of my favorite biblical scholars, in his book, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, on page 63, he furnishes us with important detail. Based on his research, he posits that the preparation of the Passover lambs involved the crucifixion of the lamb. You heard that right. He suggests, based on his research, that it was commonplace for the Jews at the time of Jesus for them to prepare their lambs by means of crucifixion. And he explains here, I'm going to read to you from page 63 of his book. He states the following, quote, The second difference between the first Exodus and the Passover at the time of Jesus has to do with the way the Passover lamb was sacrificed in the temple. Fascinatingly, we have evidence that in the first century A.D., the Passover lambs in the temple were not only sacrificed, they were, so to speak, crucified. As the Israeli scholar Joseph Tabori has shown, according to the Mishnah, at the time when the temple still stood, after the sacrifice of the lamb, the Jews would drive, quote, thin, smooth staves, unquote, of wood through the shoulders of the lamb in order to hang it and skin it. In addition to this first rod, they would also, quote, thrust, unquote, a, quote, skewer of pomegranate wood, unquote, through the Passover lamb, quote, from its mouth to its buttocks, unquote. As Tabri concludes, quote, an examination of the rabbinic evidence seems to show that in Jerusalem, the Jewish Paschal lamb was offered in a manner which resembled a crucifixion. Unquote. This conclusion is supported by the writings of St. Justin Martyr, a Christian living in the mid-2nd century A.D. In his dialogue with a Jewish rabbi named Trypho, Justin states, quote, For the lamb which is roasted is roasted and dressed up in the form of a cross. For one spit is transfixed right through from the lower parts up to the head and one across the back, to which are attached the legs of the lamb. Unquote. Dr. Petrie concludes, If these descriptions of the Passover lambs in the Mishnah and Justin Martyr are accurate, and there is no good reason to doubt them, then on numerous occasions, Jesus himself would have witnessed the, quote, crucifixions, unquote, of thousands of Passover lambs in the Jerusalem temple. This is an aspect of the Passover in his day that is neither mentioned in the Bible nor part of the modern-day Jewish Seder, but which has the power to shed light on Jesus' conception of his own fate. As we will see in a moment, Jesus is going to compare his suffering and death to the death of the Passover lamb. One reason he might have done this is that he expected that the manner of his death would resemble that of the lambs in the temple. 
not only would his lifeblood be poured out, but he too would be, quote, crucified, unquote, his body transfixed to the wooden beams of a Roman cross, like many other Jews before him, close quote. This I find to be fascinating. Just place yourselves in the first century sandals of Peter and John as they approached the temple. They would have seen thousands of men carrying these crucified lambs. Just think about this, this image. They themselves would have had to crucify their own paschal lamb and transport this crucified lamb from the temple to the upper room. Now striking it would have been for Peter and John to behold the crucified one who was identified by John the Baptist as the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It is just absolutely stunning to consider the the historical backdrop and what they would have experienced on that faithful Passover. Now, getting back to the text, we pick up in verse 22. And as they were eating, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Let's stop there. So Jesus here is instituting the Holy Eucharist. And he's taking bread And he is declaring this bread to be his body. He takes the wine, the wine that has filled this this cup, this chalice, and he declares this wine to be his blood. And this is a callback, if you remember, to John chapter 6, the famous sermon that he delivered, this discourse that he delivered in the synagogue at Capernaum when he declared himself to be the living bread come down from heaven. You turn with me to John chapter 6. I'm just going to cite for you a few verses from that lengthy discourse, beginning in verse 52, verses 52 through 56. We read as follows, quote, The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Stop there for a second. Think about the significance and the import of these words. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat. And when you survey this lengthy discourse, Jesus is using very explicit language. He's using Greek terms like trogo and phago. Just look at the text. Verse 53 Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat, the Greek term there is phagete from the verb phago, which means to consume, to devour. Unless you consume, unless you devour the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Verse 54, he who eats, trogon is the word used there from the verb trogo, which means to gnaw, to chew. In other words, he who gnaws, he who chews my flesh and drinks my blood, has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 55, For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Verse 56, He who eats, once again, throgon, he who chews my flesh and drinks my blood, abides in me, and I in him. Close quote. Let's stop there. (laughs) Jesus, here in John chapter 6, is delivering this Eucharistic discourse and he is alienating his entire congregation. I mean, even his disciples are scratching their heads. They don't understand the significance of Jesus' words, but Jesus here is anticipating the institution of the Holy Eucharist at the Last Supper. And the Jews who up until this point were following after Jesus and were seeking more signs from him, they had just been fed by Jesus who multiplied the loaves and the fishes and they were looking for another handout, a free meal, Jesus stuns them with this discourse and they are horrified. They are disgusted by what Jesus seems to be implying 
they're disgusted, which is why it states in verse 52, the Jews then disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They are horrified by this. Further along in verse 60, we read as follows. Many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? They were repulsed by this discourse. They did not understand. Jesus was pointing forward to the institution of the Holy Eucharist. And here we pick up in our gospel, going back to our gospel text, here in verse 22, as they were eating, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them, and said, take, this is my body. He takes the cup, and he gives thanks. He gives it to them. They all drank of it, and he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant. This is my body. This is my blood. This is all tied to that Eucharistic discourse in John chapter 6. Now, I want to double click on this declaration. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And I want you to understand just again, the context they're celebrating the Passover meal and Jesus is taking bread, unleavened bread. He's blessing it, breaking it, giving it to them and declaring, this is my body. He's taking this cup, this chalice filled with wine and declaring this wine to be his blood, the blood of the covenant. This is a callback to the Exodus. The only other time we find in scripture, this declaration being made is by Moses during the Exodus. And in fact, our first reading is taken from that very passage. If you turn with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 24. In Exodus 24, Moses is ratifying the covenant between God and and God's people, Israel. We pick up here in verse 3, which states, quote, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins. And half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it upon the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Once again, behold the blood of the covenant. What is Jesus doing at the Last Supper? Jesus, the new Moses, he is establishing a new covenant in his blood. Going back to Exodus 24 here, we have, and this is fascinating to consider, we have a liturgy of the word followed by a sacrifice involving blood. Sound familiar? In our liturgy, we begin with the liturgy of the word. This passage here references the book of the covenant, it states here. Verse 7, then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. And following this liturgy of the word, we have the sacrifice. We have the pouring out of the blood. And when you consider the fact that we are reflecting upon the last supper, Jesus takes a cup, he takes a chalice filled with wine and declares, this is the blood of the covenant. This is a callback to Exodus chapter 24. Again, a liturgy of the word, followed by a liturgy of sacrifice. In the case of Jesus, we have the sacrifice of his own flesh and blood. He's anticipating his crucifixion. And so here in this passage, we have a foreshadowing of what we find at the Last Supper. 
these words, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Jesus declares in verse 24 of Mark 14, And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Jesus is the mediator of a new and everlasting covenant, which is in fact the very subject of our epistle. Let's turn to our epistle from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 9, verses 11 through 15, which declares the following, quote, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, taking not the blood of goats and calves, but his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of a heifer sanctifies for the purification of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred which redeems them from the transgressions under the first covenant. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to read that final verse here. Therefore he, namely Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred. And this is speaking of the death of Jesus, the sacrificial death of the Lamb of God, since a death has occurred which redeems them from the transgressions under the first covenant. Now, by transgressions under the first covenant, going back to Exodus chapter 24, remember that the Israelites, they, they promised, they pledged themselves to loyalty following the declaration of the proclamation of God's word and his ordinances. What was the response on the part of the Israelites? We will obey we will obey the commands of the Lord. We will be obedient and faithful to his ordinances. But we know full well that that was a hollow and empty promise. Because in chapter 32 of Exodus, we find the Israelites embroiled, engaged in idolatry. That's the golden calf incident. And Moses descends from Mount Sinai only to discover that the Israelites had already broken the fundamental commandment of the Lord, and were engaged in idolatry and the worship of a golden calf. And so right from the start, Israel was unfaithful to the commands of the Lord. Go back to Exodus chapter 24. In following the pledge and the promise on the part of God's people to be faithful to God's ordinances, we find following the sacrifice of these animals that Moses, he in verse 6 he takes half of the blood and puts it in basins, in chalices. And half of the blood he throws against the altar. Don't miss that. He throws half of the blood on the altar. And then what does he do with the remainder of the blood? Look at verse 8. And Moses took the blood and threw it upon the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Half of the blood poured on the altar. Half of the blood poured on the people. Now, the blood poured on the altar, that represents the blood oath of the Lord. The altar represents God. Half of the blood poured on the altar. Half of the blood poured on the people. This is a blood covenant. Remember, a sacrifice has been offered here. And the people are pledging themselves that if they break God's commandments, that their blood is to be shed. In other words, that they would suffer the penalty of death, the shedding of their own blood if they were to break this covenant because a blood oath has been sworn here between God and his people. And here in Hebrews, going back to the text, I just want to point this out to you. 
It states, therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred, which redeems them from the transgressions under the first covenant. Clearly from chapter 32 of Exodus, the golden calf incident, all the way through the Old Testament, Israel continued to sin against the Lord, to break the covenant that they established between themselves and God at Mount Sinai. And so they were guilty. And as a result, they merited what? Death. Death and annihilation. The shedding of their blood. But what takes place? God himself condescends, humbles himself, takes on the form of a human being. He becomes incarnate in the person of Jesus. And he offers himself. God sheds his own blood for the salvation of his people, for the salvation of the world, and takes upon himself the sins of the world. Going back to Hebrews, since a death has occurred, which redeems them from the transgressions under the first covenant. This passage from Hebrews beautifully binds the Old Testament with the New Testament, the Old Covenant with the New Covenant, ratified and established by the shedding of the blood of Jesus, by the piercing of his flesh. So here we find the author of Hebrews making mention of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, ratified and established by Jesus. Therefore, verse 15, he, namely Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant covenant new covenant in his blood powerful now this covenant of which the author to the hebrew speaks was the covenant that was promised if you survey the scriptures the old testament scriptures this was a prophecy that was delivered through the prophets and in particular i'm thinking of jeremiah the prophet in his writings we find numerous allusions to what to this new covenant that god would establish. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 and 32, which reads as follows, quote, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Again, he's speaking of a new covenant. Verse 32, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. He's speaking of the exodus. My covenant, watch this, which they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. This is a reference to Exodus 32, the golden calf incident, when Israel broke the covenant that they had sworn to the Lord, to uphold and to obey and to remain faithful to. So here is a reference to this new covenant. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Another passage, Jeremiah 32, in verse 40, we read as follows, quote, I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. Close quote. Jeremiah 50, turn with me to Jeremiah 50, and verse 5. We read as follows, quote, They shall ask the way to Zion with faces turned toward it, saying, Come, let us join ourselves to the Lord in an everlasting covenant which will never be forgotten. Close quote. So we find here, I'm just giving you a few examples of what we find in the writings of the prophets, this promise, this prophecy concerning the new covenant that will be established in the Messianic age. Now, Getting back to the gospel, we pick up in verse 25. Jesus declares solemnly, Truly I say to you, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Let's stop there. And so what's going on here? Jesus is anticipating two things. He's anticipating his passion and death on the cross And he's also anticipating his glorious resurrection and ascension to the right hand of the Father and the establishment of his reign, of his kingdom, 
Truly, I say to you, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine. Why? Because he's about to endure his passion and his death on the cross until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. In order to fully understand what Jesus is alluding to here, again, we have to have knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures and the fact that that the Messianic age was anticipated, was described as an age characterized by new wine. Wine is a symbol of joy and of gladness, of abundance. And it is employed in the Old Testament scriptures as a symbol for the kingdom to come, a symbol for the age of the Messiah. I think of passages like Isaiah 25. Turn with me to the book of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 25, verses 6 through 9, which reads as follows, quote, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wine on the lees well refined. And he will destroy on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him that he may save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Close quote. Isn't that a powerful passage? Again, a passage anticipating the Messianic age, a passage anticipating the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah, who will bring salvation. It will be said on that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This passage anticipates the Messianic age, the age of the Messiah, who will bring about the establishment of a new covenant and a new kingdom. And wine is symbolic of that Messianic age. He will bring forth new wine, wine well refined. It states in verse 6, on this mountain, Mount Zion, the Lord of hosts, will make for all peoples a feast. This anticipates the wedding supper of the Lamb. And that's what Jesus is anticipating when he declares this in verse 25 of our gospel. Truly I say to you, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. That is an anticipation of the wedding supper of the Lamb, the heavenly banquet that he speaks of throughout his public ministry. And if you turn with me to Revelation 19 and verse 9, we read as follows, And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus, in Mark's gospel, in this verse 25, is anticipating not only his passion and death, but also his glorious resurrection and ascension to the right hand of the Father the consummation of his mission and is anticipating that heavenly banquet, the wedding supper of the lamb. This is a glorious image for us. As we consider this great mystery of the Eucharist, the Eucharist is an anticipation of the glory yet to be revealed. It is an anticipation, a foretaste of the wedding supper of the lamb. Then finally, we conclude our reflection With this verse, verse 26, which states, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And when they had sung a hymn, what hymn did they sing? We know exactly the hymn that they sung. Just consider this, the hymn that Jesus himself sang. They would have sung the Hallel Psalms. This is a collection of psalms. Hallel means praise. These were praise psalms. These were psalms, beginning in Psalm 113 all the way through Psalm 118. These were psalms that were sung during these pilgrimage festivals. They would sing these psalms on the way to Jerusalem. They would sing these psalms in the temple. The priests would be chanting these psalms as they offered the sacrificial lambs 
and these psalms were sung during the Passover meal. In fact, Psalms 113 through 114 were sung during the meal, and following the meal, according to the Mishnah, which is a collection of Jewish traditions, we're told that Psalms 115 through 118 were sung following the Passover meal. So we know exactly which psalms or hymns were sung following the Passover meal. It says here, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And in fact, for our responsorial psalm, we're going to be reading from one of those Hallel psalms, which Jesus and his disciples would have sung following the Last Supper. The response is taken from verse 13. I will take up or lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Now, what has Jesus just done at the Last Supper? He has done just this. He has lifted up the cup of salvation, and he's called upon the name of the Lord. Now, as we go through these few verses, I want you to to consider the fact that Jesus would have been singing this hymn. He would have been praying this hymn. And I want you to discover along with me the Christological significance of these verses. They really are messianic. They really are Christological. They are keyed to the very life of Jesus. And we begin in verse 12. What shall I render to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, of his holy ones. Jesus is anticipating his death. He is leaving the upper room. He's going to cross the Kidron Valley, ascend the Mount of Olives, and enter into the Garden of Gethsemane, where he will begin his agony and his passion. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Verse 16, O Lord, I am thy servant, I am thy servant, the son of thy handmaid. Now, of whom is Jesus speaking here? He's speaking of his mother. He's speaking of Mary, the blessed mother. She, in response to the angelic salutation, declares what? I am the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. And she furnishes to her son, whom she raised, this example, this yes to God, this fiat. And here Jesus is emulating his mother, the example of his mother, declaring himself to be God's servant. O Lord, I am thy servant. I am thy servant, the son of thy handmaid. Jesus is singing about his mother. He is extolling her. We do the same at Mass. We acknowledge the example of our blessed mother. She is invoked at every liturgy. Thou, Jesus continues, thou hast loosed my bonds. Verse 17, I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. Now, this is very significant. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving. This is a reference to the sacrifice known as the Tuda, the Tuda offering, which involved the offering of bread and wine, which obviously is a foreshadowing of the Holy Eucharist. And the term for thanksgiving here in the Greek is eucharistia, which is where we get the word Eucharist, which means thanksgiving. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving. That's what Jesus has just done in the upper room, the Eucharist. He has confected, established this sacrament. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. Finally, verse 18 I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Close quote. So this psalm, this Hallel psalm, this psalm of praise, when you consider that it is Christocentric in nature, you can see how it is keyed to the very life of Christ. It's so impactful to consider that as we pray this psalm, as we sing this hymn, that this would have been the very hymn that Jesus and his disciples sang on that faithful night, that Holy Thursday, 2,000 years ago. Powerful. Now, I want to bring this episode to a close by citing just one brief but relevant passage from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and it is paragraph 1323. 
which states as follows, and I quote, At the Last Supper, on the night he was betrayed, our Savior instituted the Eucharistic sacrifice of his body and blood. This he did in order to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross throughout the ages until he should come again, and so to entrust to his beloved spouse, the Church, a memorial of his death and resurrection, a sacrament of love, a sign of unity, a bond of charity, a paschal banquet in which Christ is consumed, the mind is filled with grace, and a pledge of future glory is given to us. Close quote. I couldn't think of a better note to end on than with that citation from the Catechism. The Holy Eucharist, we have a pledge of future glory. As I mentioned earlier, whenever we receive the Holy Eucharist, this is a foretaste of the glory yet to be revealed, a foretaste of the wedding supper of the Lamb, through which we are united to Christ and his once-for-all sacrifice on Calvary. And this food, this super substantial food that Jesus gives to us is his own glorified flesh and blood for the life of the world. My prayer, my brothers and sisters, as we prepare to celebrate this wonderful solemnity of the most holy body and blood of Christ, my prayer is that we would deepen our understanding and appreciation of this glorious sacrament. Jesus pledged to his disciples, lo, I am with you always until the end of time. And he is faithful to that pledge. He is faithful to that pledge and we experience the perpetual and abiding presence of Jesus in such a tangible and powerful way through the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. Through the sacrament, Jesus offers to us his sacred flesh, his glorified flesh and blood to sustain us on our journey towards the promised land. Let us pray not only for ourselves that our faith would be deepened, our Eucharistic faith would be renewed and revived, but let us pray also for those who have yet to discover the beauty and the power and the splendor and the glory of this mystery of our faith. My friends, on that note, this brings our episode to a close. As always, my fervent hope and prayer is that this podcast series has been and continues to be a source of blessing, spiritual inspiration, and nourishment for you. If it has been, praise God for that. I want to encourage you, if you're watching this via our YouTube channel, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. By liking and subscribing, you indicate to YouTube that there's great value in this content, and they're more apt to push these videos out to more and more viewers, and that's the whole point of this channel. It exists to evangelize and to make Christ known. So please, like, comment, and subscribe. If you'd like to take a step further and help me in this endeavor, if you'd like to make this podcast a blessing for others, consider becoming a patron, a supporter of this podcast. You can do so by visiting patreon.com forward slash Hector Molina. And if you're not in a position to sow a small monthly seed to support this work, I encourage you to visit buymeacoffee.com forward slash Hector Molina. On that website, on that platform, you're also able to support the work that we're doing here by buying me a cup of coffee or two or three or four Every little bit counts as there are fixed costs associated with the production of this podcast. Every little bit helps. So please consider supporting this work. Become a patron or consider buying me a cup or two of coffee. And speaking of supporters, I want to thank all of my amazing patrons and coffee buyers for your continued partnership and support. I wouldn't be able to do this without you. And so my friends, until we gather next week to consider the readings for another great solemnity, the solemnity of the sacred heart of Jesus. My prayer continues to be for you in the words of the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. May the word of God continue to richly dwell in you. God love you.